want to quickly make, I want to invite Solomon Abbey here to the stage. So uh, please give Solomon because he, he's very shy, you know. Uh, here, uh, there you go. How are you, Solomon? I'm great. Thanks, uh, Oscar. You're, you're good. Great. So let me let me uh, uh, just uh, do a not a quick introduction. You better. I think it's better if you introduce yourself. But okay. Solomon has been he's been setting this up for you all, right? Like he's been handling everything for for the, from the organizational perspective, and he's gonna be uh, MC in here. Like he's gonna be our 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 our, our host for the day, right, uh, Solomon? Yeah. So I think it's best if I just leave out here and let you uh, you know uh, drive this, right? Talk to you later, all right. Solomon. All right. Thanks, Oscar. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's such a beautiful day out here in the city of Lagos. Uh, that's where I'm uh, actually communicating from. Uh, we've, uh, over the years, kind of understood that uh, uh, we have a lot of great designers out there, uh, people who have skills, people who are really talented, uh, who could essentially be able to do a few more things in terms of uh, making impact globally. And what we've been trying to do is essentially create an avenue for them to be able to showcase what they've got. And showcasing what they've got essentially means we will be able to get them to the point where they are ready, uh, more like enterprise ready, to be able to uh, appeal to all of the audiences that they might want to kind of appeal to in terms of uh, telling them their story about how great they are as designers. Uh, beyond that, I have like uh, other two panelists with me that will be working through the entire design portfolio workshop. I have Drew Nutt and I also have Ricardo Mota. Uh, but before I kind of go to them, I want to show you through how you kind of get into Andela Network as a product designer, essentially, uh, irrespective of this field, essentially from uh, either being a UI UX designer or visual designer, UX writer, maybe um, you're an interaction designer as well. Uh, we kind of have opportunities for you, essentially. Uh, some of the things that we want to be able to do today is to walk you through how you might be able to walk through your journey in terms of being enterprise ready, being job ready, so that whoever is going through your portfolio will know that, uh, yeah, this guy that we're going through his work is actually the right guy for the job. Uh, essentially, when you get in, uh, the first thing you do is you want to fill your application form, which is similar to what is on the website that Oscar has kind of told you about. Uh, beyond that, you will take an English assessment. Uh, the goal of that is for us to be able to understand how well you're able to kind of communicate with some of the clients that we have uh, all over the globe. Uh, beyond that, we will take a quick uh, design assessment. It's just a basic fundamental design assessment to be able to like uh, get you through the hoops and essentially get you uh, ready to for us to kind of go through your portfolio. Uh, the, the second to the last stage, which is essentially the last stage for you, is like that portfolio review stage where we ex essentially go through your project, uh, maybe one project from your portfolio to be able to understand your range, uh, your processes, and in terms of also understanding how empathetic you are in terms of the problems that you've been solving for users over the years. Uh, the last stage of essentially is where you will have the profile editing where you will be able to like input some one or two information about yourself, uh, your skill set and the rest like that. And once you're, do, once you're kind of done this, uh, you're on your way to getting matched with the opportunities that fit you, uh, that will be able to empower you uh, to scale as a designer beyond some of the limitations that you might have uh, previously. Uh, without talking too much, I will kind of want to hand over uh, to Ricardo Mota, and his goal is essentially to tell you about the best practices uh, for your de design portfolio, essentially how you will be able to like get your portfolio uh, in the right shape for opportunities. All right, I think I can just hand over to Ricardo now. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Really excited to have you all here. Uh, okay, so everyone can see my presentation, right? So yeah, I'm really excited to have everyone here. Uh, as Salomon and Oscar explained it, we are really excited to start to create this design environment. So yeah, the, the goal of this presentation here is to help you guys to start to elaborate a bit, a bit more the portfolios, you know. Uh, it is something that we are feeling in some portfolios and it is also a feedback from some clients and let's go. So let's let's go with some some six topics here. First of all, is clients obviously. So let's understand the clients. Let's go on some platforms. Let's go also on some basic format tips. Here I'm not going inside specific, 
in specific in specific areas. So I'm going more in general portfolio. So don't we are not going deep in UX or UI. So it is generic portfolio. So our tips in in general areas. Also, we are going uh, in the anatomy of a case study. Also, going in some tips and tricks that we could explore, and also res uh, fun and, and useful resources. So let's understand more the clients. So we have basically three types of clients uh, right now. The first one is the recruiter. So the recruiter basically has low understanding on design language. They tend to be like really uh, uh, catchy on, on visuals. You know, they like to understand the process that you have behind the design and they really like fancy designs. The second one would be a design manager or someone like a design lead. They really want to understand the process that you created behind the design work. So they, lead, they want to understand the overcomes, the challenge they face it during the design work. And also they need to understand like the, the role that you manage during the, your work experience. The third one would be the executive team leadership. So that type of person is someone that is really into data. So they really want to understand the metrics, the, the impact that the design uh, caused in the, in the company. So metrics are really important to them. Not, I'm not saying that those types of, of, of persons, they are not connected. Sometimes they are all together. So, but we have to understand that that type of information, it is really important. Moving on to the platforms, also, platforms, it is really important. When we are talking to clients, we have to understand that we need to provide a better platform as possible. So to make our, our work shine, we have to provide the, the better place. So we have a lot of free platforms. I, I'm pretty sure that everyone here knows Behance or Dribble, uh, Adobe Portfolio, even Notion, for example. I saw some really cool portfolios using Notion. But to really stand out, I really advise you guys to create your own experience. So, for example, using Webflow, Editor X, WordPress, or even Squarespace, it is a great option. Com the combination between Behance and even, for example, your own experience using, for example, Webflow, it is a great choice. Because also Behance and, for example, Dribble, it is a really cool option because you have like this type of community uh, environment of designers so it is a great choice be between like two, uh, sharing your work with different designers and also uh, sharing uh, uh, sharing knowledge and, and comments but also guys it is something that uh, the, the the goal of the of the webinar here it is to provide you options the the the, the key thing here it is the the most important part it is the work if you have something like a really cool case study inside of notion it is better than something like a poor case study inside of a very fancy platform like webflow for example some uh, basic format tips i think it is very basic but it is very important to show, to explain um it is simple but let's go uh inside of the first step also, it is a, uh, a general information, but it is important. You have to provide a personal statement. Uh, also, if you have awards, it is important to show, you know, it is something that clients pay attention. It is uh, something that you're, you're, you are a product, you know, you're trying to sell yourself. So it is time to do that. On the hero section, it is also a part of where you can show some intros or something like a, a, a project uh, call out. So it is time to show that. So it is the first part of the project that you, you're able to show. Showing something like a call to action to a fast contact, also a, a, a fine way to show a, a quick way to contact you. It is also essential. In the first step, showing fast ways of and easy ways to understand your the, the projects that you have. Also really impactful images are, are good ways to show your projects. It is super important. Let's go and in, in, in deep, do a deep dive inside of, the, of a case study. 
So let's go and understand the anatomy of a case study. So the hero section, in my opinion, will be the one of the key parts of a case study. It is the first thing that the client will see. And in my opinion, it is the part that will create the first impact. So it is highly recommended that you use like a very high resolution image. Maybe not, could be not a high resolution, but you could use, for example, animation. For example, in that case, the Vault Studio here uses a, a nice animation showing an uh, image that uh, show like an overview of the concept here. So it is the first image. So you're trying to sell your project, you know, in a very impactful way. Also, in the second step, it is the project details. So you have to, to tell your client, okay, that's the project. That's the organization that requested. That's the team I work at here doing that. That was the desired product. That was the, the deliverable. And I was doing that. The second step, it is obviously showing the problem. That was the problem. I was working that in a clear and fast way. So also don't put a lot of text. So you have to be concise, you know, have to be clear and short. No one has time to read a lot of text here. There, you have to be clear and short, showing the hypotheses, the challenges, the solutions, the problems. Here, for example, it is a very short example from Voight's team. So they are showing, for example, here, uh, fast research, showing some surveys, some explanations, some, some findings they had during the process. Also showing the process, it is really important. So the, the, as I mentioned before, the design team, they need to understand like the, the mind of the designer, you know, they, they need to understand how you think, you know. So for example, here, the second step, they need to understand the process. They need to understand how you define the, the, the challenge, how you define like the direction that you, that you decided to go, how you, if you do, if you did the interview, if you did the research, if you did a survey, if you did a uh, analysis, you know, so they need to understand how you made the decisions. Now it is time to do the walkthrough. So after all the process, you decided to go and track a, a direction. So now it is time to shine. So you, you decided that direction. Now you're throwing like the, almost like the final stage of your design. And now to back up your, your design, like shy, like the, I will not say fancy screens, but like the final design concepts, you have to back up your, your design concepts with environmental uh, uh, images. For example, in that case, uh, the designer here, Jarek, he used some, some images to back up his design. So for example, he, he designed one, 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 uh, app here for, I think it is a smart, smart home uh, application. And he used it on very nice image of a home here. And he created also a, a illustration and, you know, and you feel that it is a environment. There is an environment here, you know, a client, when he, see, he sees that he feels like a, there is a, a storytelling, there is a, a communication between the image and this, and the, and the app. So you have like a, the combination between the process, you have a communication between the, the screen and the background image. After that, you also, you, you're able to combine that with the ROI of UX. So now it is a time also to put some data here. So you're able to put and put some metrics. So you're able to combine here, like, okay, that was the return that I, I was able to, to get from the design. Now also, it is the time to put some lesson and learnings. I also put some metrics. Okay, now I, I, I was able to get uh, that number of downloads or those users or, okay, I was able to release that, that app on Apple Store. Also, clients love to see live demos. If you have something like that, it is the place to go and the place to put. Let's go to some trips and, and, and tips and tricks. First of all, as I just mentioned, tell a story. Use, use storytelling is essential. This is the way to connect the client and you. So if you create the empathy, it is a great option to connect the client and you. So they could, this is the way they are able to correlate with you and correlate with the project. 
headlines and, and pay attention to, actually it is pay attention to details. When they see that you pay attention to details from typos to hierarchy. So when you have the order, it is really essential. Also less is more. It is a, I would say it is a mantra for designers. So don't, if you have a lot of elements, it is complicated. So I would say minimalistic, minimalistic approach, it is always safer. So try to minimize the design, try to be safer. It is always a, be a better option. Device mockups. It is something that I also noted a lot. So use mockups to amplify your design, not distract from the, from the, the design. A lot of times I see like someone using a 3D uh, mockup to show the to show the the screen, for example. What I want to see it is a screen. I'm not a, here to see like the the fancy 3D mockup. So I would prefer to see like a a, a flat 3D mockup with the screen visible to see like a fa a very fancy isometric 3D mockup. You know, clients also are the same. Use more visuals. Also, it is the same feedback that I, I was giving before. Balance between text and images are essential. You have to balance that. You have to combine images and text. It is essential to give information, as I mentioned before, but you have to balance that. Avoid endless scrolling pages. Also, as I mentioned, clients, they, they have, like, it is time consuming to them to scroll pages. So be concise. Uh, try to break down pages in smaller pieces. This way they are able to digest and they are able to see more case studies, you know, quality over quantity. Also, if you have like eight case studies or if you have more than than four case studies and you feel that you're able to, to minimize that and, and put more quality, try to do that, you know, try to f have like four type of flagship case studies instead of eight not so good ones. Design system. Design system, obviously it is complex to create a design system in just one case study. Design systems are really complex, but show that you are you pay attention to details, you know, show, show that you have like uh, perspectives of organization. It is really important to clients. Show that you have like, uh, that you have, for example, also for in terms of branding or that you have like attention to different parts of, of areas of design, it is really important. Passwords. I know that for designers, sometimes it is important to protect work, but think, on, think about clients. Sometimes they don't have time to request passwords. So I know that it is sometimes hard, but avoid use passwords. Different audience. It is important to be flexible. So try to design to different audiences. So sometimes we have portfolios with the same type of clients. So try to be uh, flexible as possible. So if you don't have a lot of different types of clients, try to imagine or try to do works that you are not used to. So for example, if I don't have uh, work, for example, I, if I don't have a Uber-like uh, work on my portfolio and I see that I have a lot of clients requesting that type of work, I have to, to do something. I have to, on my free time, I have to do a rebrand of something like that. And I have to imagine something. I have to go and, okay, I have to imagine how I would do Uber for older population, you know, and I have to be a designer and try to think on that, you know, clients will see that and see a different product to a different audience. And that will be a different case study. Obviously it will not be like something really complex as a case study that you're going to have like super deep data, but it will be a case study. Uh, don't be timid, be bold. I think that's a really, really important uh, thing. So you have to be uh, bold in terms of the client needs to understand who you are. They need to understand uh, who, uh, who you are in terms of design in a few seconds. So you need to you need to have your design language. You need to to provide your design language in a few seconds. So try to to provide your design language on your designs. Designs in motion. It is also super important. 
So it is also super eye-catchy and something that I'm not seeing in a lot of portfolios. And if you try to provide some micro interactions, some, some products in action, it is also super important. Uh, some resources. Here it is a very simple resource library that I just selected. I'm pretty sure that everyone here uh, it is familiar with some of those libraries here. I'm just going to give you some seconds to screenshot here. Uh, but LS Graphics, it is a really uh, nice platform for mockups. And Un Blast, it is also a pretty uh, a good uh, mockup. Libraries for stock images, those are, are pretty good. Paxos, Unsplash, Burst for, from uh, Shopify, Illustrations, I Icons 8, Open Dottles, Humans, on awesome flatcon in free pick so those are pretty good i'm just going to do like more three seconds here for for a screenshot and it is pretty much it thank you guys i'm just going to handle to drill hi everybody uh, i'm drew uh, i'm the commercial head of design and product for andela I uh, joined back in May. I'm super excited to uh, to be speaking to everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a, a real life example of my portfolio in hopes uh, to kind of bring to life some of the concepts that uh, uh, Ricardo shared with with you, and and kind of give you my uh, my model for uh, building a great portfolio and, and a great case study. Um, so one of the first things that uh, uh, I really want to highlight for everyone is uh, to understand the kind of where the uh, the uh, the managers or the recruiters are are coming from. They're going to come from uh, you know they're going to land on your portfolio from most likely your resume or CV. So you want to make sure that uh, uh, your hero really stands out. Um, you want to make sure to introduce yourself, uh, put your uh, position or title uh, at the top. So like I say, hi, I'm Drew, uh, I'm a human-centered design leader. And then I give a brief um, personal statement and I say, I design products and experiences that create outcomes and influence user behavior. So that gives the clients a, a pretty, pretty solid uh, understanding of who I am and what I do. Uh, the other, the other thing I want to highlight is uh, at the top we always want to have uh, one or two calls to action. So in this, uh, in this circumstance, uh, I have a contact me button, and I have a view case study button. So that's the the th the two goals that I want to accomplish uh, when when I have a client or someone review my portfolio. I either want them to uh, give me a shout. I want them, I want them to get in contact with me or uh, I want them to view my case studies. Um, so one thing I want to highlight with, uh, with the case studies, uh, I like the idea of having uh, two to four case studies, I would say is a good, uh, a good starting point. I think that's kind of the magic number. I think any less than, than two, uh, you might not be able to highlight uh, you know, your, your full capabilities and any more than four, uh, I think, uh, a little overboard. And, and like, uh, Ricardo mentioned, uh, we want to focus on, uh, quality, not, uh, not quantity here. Uh, always remember to, uh, start with your best case study. Uh, first, I would always lead with, uh, uh, the work that you're most proud of. It's going to be that, that first case study that you have listed on the lot, like for, for me and for instance here, uh, at and feature store, um, that that's going to be the most clicked, uh, case study. So you're going to want to put your, your, your best work there. Uh, I would say as far as format goes, uh, what you want to do is, is, is have a good, uh, screenshot, high resolution, resolution screenshot that, uh, that helps your audience understand what it is the, the product or the design does. Uh, I would always recommend when possible to have uh, the latest devices and uh, kind of be con consistently thinking about uh, updating your devices uh, that, that, you, uh, that you use for your mockups. Um, 
if it's a if it's a strong design but it's a little bit uh old just putting it in in, in a in a uh in a new <clears throat> mock-up for instance like the uh the new imac uh really helps freshen uh freshen the look and uh, uh it helps clue uh, or key clients into uh the fact that you're uh you know this is a modern uh design work and um i think that uh, uh that really helps a lot uh, you want to tell the client, uh, you know, the, who the, who the work was for or the, the, the product that you were designing for, uh, also, uh, a brief, uh, catchy description of, uh, what the product does or what its function is and, uh, a couple highlights on either the practice areas or the verticals for what you designed. And, uh, as far as selection goes, uh, for the case studies that you want to highlight, I think it's good to have a diverse, as diverse as possible, of um, uh, uh, different types of products or uh, designs. Uh, for instance, in my case, I have a, I start off with AT&T Feature Store, which is a uh, enterprise level machine learning platform. I have a design system, I have a mobile app, and I have a uh, uh, business to consumer, or actually business to business SaaS product. So those are my four uh, case studies that I uh, chose to, to to display right off the bat, and I think that's a pretty uh, diverse example of uh, of my capabilities as a uh, as a designer. So that's what we want to show. We want to show our our uh, our diversity, and that we have both desktop, mobile, uh, design systems is really helpful. I think in the next uh, uh, four to five years. Um, if a if an organization doesn't have a design system, they will, and uh, they're going to need resources to uh, to build it, to govern it, and to 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 keep it evolving over time. Um, <clears throat> and the last thing I would want to point out is I think it's pretty helpful. Uh, this is the one the one time that I would suggest everybody think inside <laughs> think inside the box. Um, and what I mean by that is to to put your uh, uh, case studies in a in a box format. It uh, it really helps, especially recruiters and design managers, uh, keep their thoughts organized uh, and and understand what the what the case study is about. Uh, I think that's very helpful, and I hear that from a lot of uh, a lot of recruiters and a lot of uh, design managers that they like to see in in a in a, in a format like that. Um, so next I'm going to just walk you through a very high level overview of my formula for, uh, for case studies. Uh, so like Ricardo mentioned, have a good, uh, have a good high res screenshot on the hero section of your case study. Uh, I find it's good to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, uh, reassert the, uh, um, kind of the overall, uh, um, purpose of the product, for instance, in, in this, uh, in this case, uh, designing an enterprise level machine learning platform that enables data scientists to make predictions at scale. Um, I think that helps, uh, kind of remind the, remind the client what, uh, uh, what they're going to be seeing in the, in, in the upcoming case study, uh, to, to highlight on a couple of things that, uh, Ricardo mentioned, uh, you want to lay out the project details up front, what the practice area was, it's really helpful to put the put the year that uh, the project was uh, either designed or executed, and uh, always make sure to call out uh, your role, what you did on the project. Give a brief uh, background uh, on what the project is about, and it always helps anytime you're you're going to be going through a a, a text heavy uh, section in your portfolio or a case study. It always helps to augment that with a few additional, uh, visuals. We want to make sure we have a good balance between, uh, between text in our, in our visuals. Uh, from there, I like to discuss the, the background, just a brief background on the actual product itself and, uh, the kind of give a highlight of the main challenge, uh, that, uh, that we hope to, uh, design for. Uh, the next, part that I think is uh, one of the most criticals, critical points up front is to highlight uh, your design process. Um, it's okay to use a stock, uh, a stock image or a stock uh, 
infographic for for the design process, for instance, if you used uh, Lean UX or design thinking. But I would I would highly recommend to uh, to make a unique uh, infographic that really highlights uh, the the process that 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 you took. Uh, from there, uh, I always like to transition from the the process section to uh, to calling out the users, and uh, that's help that helps reinforce up front that uh, uh, that you're a user centered designer, human centered designer, and, and that the the users are uh, who you're thinking about uh, first. Uh, from there, um, I think it's critical to and kind of give a brief of how you understand or come to understand or realize the, the, the user problems and the, and the limitations up front. Uh, I think it's really important and I'll tie this into uh, to the end of the case study where I, where I walk through outcomes, but we want, you want to let clients know that, uh, that you understand um, how the success or failure of a project is, is measured. I think that's, uh, critical for any client to to know that their product designers or UX designers have a have a really good understanding of what success and failure means. So, for instance, in this in this case for this uh, uh, AT and T feature store case study, uh, the the client AT and T had a set of uh, uh, velocity metrics and KPIs that uh, that was their. Uh, primary indicator, their stakeholders' primary indicator on how, uh, how well uh, the product uh, functions. Uh, so things like cognitive load, volume of data processed, time to productionize machine learning models, time to develop new features, time to deploy models, and numbers of features created per cycle. So I like to highlight those up front and uh, eventually uh, tie them in uh, to, to each design problem, to each design challenge that, uh, that I solved for, and then uh, highlight the outcomes at the, at the end. Um, <clears throat> uh, at that point, it's, uh, you, you get into the, uh, the question of what, you know, what do we want to, what do we want to show about the, the project? And I think it's important to um, really understand what you want to convey uh, to your viewers, to the clients, uh, about your particular uh, design work, about your project or product, um, I would say, you know, limit. You know, you don't have to. I guess my point is, you don't have to show every uh, every asset or deliverable that that you know that you created for a particular project. Uh, you want to highlight the most meaningful. Uh, deliverables and assets, ones that uh, uh, support your story. And uh, so for, in this case, uh, I wanted to, uh, to highlight how we synthesized research data. I wanted to highlight the personas to, to show uh, how we framed our research insights and turned them into ideation points. And I drove that home with uh, empathy maps and uh, user journeys. And then I start discussing, and this is probably the, the only time I would recommend going a little bit heavier on the, on the text is uh, to start formulating, giving the clients an understanding of how you turn uh, research into uh, actionable ideation points. So I took kind of the highlights of, uh, of what we learned from users and uh, kind of highlighted some potential uh, solutions to those that, uh, that we would, uh, uh, that I would describe through my design process, essentially. Uh, I think up front, it's good to pick maybe four or five different design challenges that, uh, uh, that were critical to um, uh, that particular product or project. I think between two and five is probably a good, uh, a good number. Uh, I think any more than five, you start running into long, really long case studies and any less than two, it's probably, uh, probably hard to, to really show what, uh, uh, what, uh, what you contributed to the, the, to the project or the product. 
Um, so yeah, I would recommend uh, two or five, pick two or five key problems that uh, you want to highlight uh, how you how you design for them. And, and uh, uh, I think that's a good starting point. Uh, I, th I also think it's really important to understand, to help the potential client understand where the starting point was. I think if you can show before and after uh, of a product, um, you can't do that obviously if it's a, if it's a new product, but if you've uh, re-architected uh, or redesigned a product, it's always good uh, to give a before and after that helps uh, uh, give a client context of, uh, uh, you know, where a design was and, and, and where, it, uh, where it ended up. And, and like I said, you probably have on, on a large project, you might have 50 or 100, maybe 150 assets that, uh, uh, that you have to, to show to, to, to build uh, a compelling story. And uh, you want to use uh, the assets that, uh, that are most compelling to, uh, to tell your story. And uh, so one of, the most, uh, one of the most important things for this particular case study was to show the starting point, like I said, the the initial not so great design uh, that the product started out as, and uh, the kind of nonlinear uh, user flow. And I think when you're showing one of the things I want to highlight, uh, you know, user flow sometimes doesn't stand well on its own, but if you show a before and after, like this is the this is the original kind of convoluted user flow. And this is the, you know, a linearized or a simpler user flow. I think that uh, it, that contrast between, between the two really helps uh, bring life to a, to a user flow or to a, to a design when you can show how you simplified a design or uh, how you made it flow more linearly. Uh, so from there, I'll kind of, kind of blow through this. I don't want to <laughs> give a, uh, to in-depth analysis of the, of the case study. But uh, what I do want to highlight is that now I go through uh, um, walking through how I designed for each of those problems that I, uh, that I highlighted earlier, those five, uh, those five problems. Um, so I think the, uh, the one thing that I want to highlight here is, you know, use hierarchy to your advantage. Most of the time a client's going to be uh, blowing through the case study, they're going to be uh, kind of skimming it. So you want to use uh, uh, solid headlines to uh, kind of highlight what the what the overall uh, problem is that uh, that you were solving, and then just a little bit of text to uh, to support uh, each uh, uh, each headline. Um, another thing that I that I think's good, uh, really good to do. And I think it, it helps demonstrate uh, one's maturity as a designer when you can present uh, a time that uh, maybe you designed something or had a design challenge and, and your initial design was, was wrong or didn't work. Uh, so for instance, in, in, this, in this, uh, this particular problem that I was solving, uh, we needed to figure out uh, a way to minimize cognitive load in uh, helping data scientists visualize highly, comp high, highly complex data flows. So my initial idea in this uh, particular case was to use a Sankey diagram. And uh, after we tested it, it was, it was not a good visualization for, uh, for this particular problem. And that's one thing I highlight here. Um, uh, my initial solution didn't work out. So I went back to the uh, to the to the drawing board and came up with a different data flow visualization. I really think um, if a designer can point to a time when when they were wrong, and then use that to uh, uh, to to frame how they use that to to grow, to learn, to 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 reframe a problem and to, to reapproach it and solve it the right way, I think that speaks volumes to a uh, the maturity and the the seniority of a designer. Um, and then. For instance, in this case, I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of the the the, the more prettier visual aspects uh, of the design process. And uh, uh, finally, I, I end with the outcomes, like I talked about earlier. I kind of highlighted them in uh, in the first section, 
the the uh, uh, the research overview uh, where we wanted to reduce cognitive load, increase volume of data process. So those key metrics uh, I bring home at the end of the case study and show uh, what uh, uh, you know through testing, through through uh, through usability testing, uh, what the what the final results were. Uh, I think once you wrap up the uh, the case study, it's always good to uh, to have a link to your uh, to an additional one or two case studies, so people don't have to uh, you know navigate uh, backwards or uh, search to find a link to to see more of your work. Let's you know plan to put it uh, uh, to make it accessible. Your other case studies, you want to you want to uh, have them highly accessible, and then. Also, give them a give them an easy way to get in touch with you at the at the bottom of the case study. Really love the case study. They don't they don't need to see anything else, but they uh, you know they want to get in touch with you. You want to give them that uh, that opportunity to to do so pretty quickly. Um, so that's kind of the the model that I use for uh, for case studies. Uh, one of the things that I want to point out is you know you don't always have to 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 show wireframes or um, you know, the, the, the progression of design, I think where it makes sense, uh, it's, it's great to, great to do that, but, uh, just consider the story that you're trying to tell and pick the best assets and the best, uh, aspects of the, uh, of the product or the project, uh, that you contributed to that, uh, that helps bring that story to life. Sometimes it's, uh, going to be research heavy. Sometimes it'll be, uh, you know, visual design heavy. Sometimes it'll be heavy on the information architecture or wireframes, but uh, I don't think there's a there's a there's a right or wrong uh, as long as you're showing uh, how you think about design, how you work through design problems. I think that's the 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 biggest uh, the biggest thing you want to do. Um, and then the final thing I would say is I would really recommend uh, you know giving giving your peers, your friends, a, a chance to, to read through some of your case studies, see how long it takes them to, to get through them, see what the layperson thinks about it, see if they're able to understand uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what story you were trying to tell and what, uh, uh, what you were trying to convey. So if I would say if a non-designer uh, can understand that, then 100% uh, a, a designer or design manager is going to be able to, uh, to understand uh, what you're trying to convey, I would say keep it short. Uh, the shorter, the the better. I know as designers, we want to be really detailed. We we want to give as much context as possible. And you know, I've fallen into this trap where I've designed case studies that you know take ten or fifteen, maybe even twenty minutes to 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 to, to get through. And that's I think that's just too much. So you got to kind of reinforce to yourself and your in, in your mind that, that uh, you know, keep it simple, um, keep it short. I think three to five minutes to, to read through a case study is, is probably ideal. Um, and if you can convey a, a complex problem or a complex set of problems in that amount of time, uh, I think you're going to get a lot of attention. And uh, that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I think we're going to open it up to uh, some questions. Amazing. Uh, thanks so much, Drew. Uh, I think yeah. we got a couple of questions here. Um, somebody was asking around, um, he was saying, what exactly is a design language? Uh, and I think it's one of the things that you talked about when you were talking about a, a mini design system, so to speak, more like a style guide that you kind of created. So uh, I don't know, maybe you want to take that right, right now. Yeah, so um, a design language is a, it's typically a set of documented rules or a framework on how an organization or a brand uh, expresses their design, their design decisions. So <clears throat> one of the, one of the goals of a design system uh, overall is to um, kind of distill down 
a lot of design decisions at the top uh, at the top level bring them into a, a well documented format so that uh, as a, a product grows and scales uh, the the time it takes to make those tight those nitty gritty design decisions like what uh, what color should text be what what uh, uh, what is the uh, the color of a um, uh, a button or what is the uh, the the padding for a button those are the types of design decisions that a design system uh, as um, uh, as essentially how would I say it as expressed through the design language so it's it's how those design se- design decisions are expressed uh, into the design systems through the design uh, is through the design language. All right, amazing. Uh, I think that uh, that kind of answers the question of uh, Joshua Rini, who kind of asked that is the design language CSS. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, but, it's, it's a, <laughs> uh, but technically, it it could be because you will like have tokens that will be translated into codes, essentially. But the design language kind of covers all of the uh, key aspects of the branding and also the the way the brand wants to be perceived terms of how you want to be perceived by potential users going through your experience, essentially, it will also include some of the UX copying that you will have in the uh, products that you're trying to, trying to roll out. Uh, I think one of the questions for you is that somebody asked if, if it is advisable to add a bit of humor or personality to your portfolio uh, in your some of your case studies. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's, that's great, to, great to do. I think uh, anything that... Uh, uh, that helps tell uh, a potential client uh, who you are as a person. Uh, I think, you know, we want to we want to show who we are as designers. But I think just just as important as who we are as designers is who we are as as people. Uh, that's that's what makes us uh, fun to be around, fun to interact with, uh, fun to collaborate with. So yeah, we definitely want to. Uh, if you're uh, if you're Funny and humorous uh, in in real life. Definitely bring that to life in in, in your portfolio. You know, don't take it overboard, but uh, you know, put your personality into uh, uh, into your portfolio. Um, that'll you know, I think that's a uh, that's something that that helps, and especially on the humor uh, on the humor side. I think mm-hmm. you know, uh, I've seen I've seen some portfolios that make me chuckle at points um, because of a funny meme or a funny gif or something like that, and. It definitely helps make it memorable and uh, kind of breaks up the monotony of, of, of reviewing portfolio after portfolio, makes it memorable. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Drew. Uh, one question here is around, so a lot of people believe that some of this uh, workshop essentially maybe is more targeted towards uh, UX design in itself. So they're asking questions around, if I'm a UX writer, for instance, or if I'm a, if, uh, maybe like a a UX researcher, do I really require kind of like a portfolio, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, um, I think in both, uh, in both cases, it's good to have, uh, uh, have a portfolio both on the writing side and on, um, uh, the research side. I think it it's probably a little bit easier for, uh, for researchers than, uh, than writers, but I've, I've, I've seen quite a few, um, uh, UX writer portfolios. And, um, you know, that's, it's an increasingly, uh, demanding, uh, position within, within UX and it really helped, you know, UX writers really help bring a brand's voice to life. And not only that, but UX writing can sometimes be the, the difference between a, a highly usable product and a, uh, and a not highly usable product. Sometimes it comes down to uh, to copy and and uh, and and writing and, and being able to uh, explain the details of a of a product or set of products, whether it's uh, you know on an e-commerce website or whether it's uh, in a uh, internal uh, enterprise application. I think that's you know that's critical. Mm-hmm. So whatever whatever you might have contributed to a, a a project show those you know show the screen show your process um i think that's uh 
uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty critical for for both to have uh, portfolios. Amazing. Uh, somebody kind of has to, if uh, as a newbie designer, uh, must you have like a live project on your portfolio, so to speak? I mean, I, I wouldn't say that that it's a must. If it, it's a must have, I think it I think it helps. I think there's for for new designers, for people who are transitioning, um, you know, it, at the very beginning, you're going to have to supplement your portfolio with the, you know, with some speculative projects or some, some, uh, uh, some redesigns, uh, of existing products. But I would, I would encourage, um, uh, a junior designer to get out there and do some, you know, if, if you don't have a, a real pro project, uh, get out there and do some pro bono work, do some, do some free work for, a uh, for an organization for, a, you know, it could be a local coffee shop. It could be, um, uh, you know, a new business, a new startup that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't have a design team, maybe a product that a uh, uh, product or service that you like. And, you know, you uh, uh, notice that they could use some help in their uh, in their in their web presence, something like that. I mean, anything, even if it's just, a, you know, a, a, a couple of page static website, I think anything that uh, uh, you can you can do to, to get some real live work in there. I think that, uh, uh, you know, you should do it. That's amazing. Uh, so there is a question from Isaac Adequiton. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite funny, though. Uh, but he kind of has that, that. How would you advise he goes about it, uh, creating a portfolio, when most of the work that he's done, he kind of did them without UX research, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one way you can, you can approach it is to, um, and I think, you know, clients are aware that, you know, not every designer is going to come with the research background. Um, I think just be honest about it. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things, even without a, uh, research that you can, um, that I would, I wouldn't maybe say quasi research, but there's, there, there are things that, that drove your design decisions. There's, uh, there's thoughts that you had, um, whether it's, you know, a competitive analysis or a comparative analysis or an audit of the existing website or, you know, something like that, going out and talking to a, a you know, couple users, potential users on, on the street or in a coffee shop doing uh, gorilla research. I think there's a lot of things that you probably don't, you know, you've probably done the research, but you're just not, since it wasn't formalized, you didn't, you didn't think of it as, as, as research, but mm -hmm. anytime you can, kind of give a background of um, some of the data points or some of the things that you thought about, how you thought about users, um, uh, you know, when you're approaching a design problem, highlight that. And that, you know, that it's, it's not formalized research, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to be. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, I have a question from Momo Francis. It says, uh, how do you measure cognitive load? Uh, so uh, in this particular uh, instance, we had uh, we used a, a tapping test. Uh, so the the uh, the users had a uh, essentially a a foot tapping device. I don't know what it's called. It was unique to to, to AT and T. So they had a foot tapping device. So they would tap their uh, tap their foot at a consistent rhythm while they uh, while they uh, went through their uh, went through their tasks and. Uh, we uh, we measured uh, the difference in in uh, their tap their foot tapping rhythm as they worked through uh, complex problems, and that was the uh, um, that's probably the oldest trick in the book to uh, to measure cognitive load. I know there are a lot of platforms uh, that get pretty advanced uh, that are you know up and coming that mm -hmm. that probably uh, can give quite a bit higher level insights, but. Uh, um, yeah, we used to, the, the, the foot tapping test. All right. Uh, I think this particular question uh, from Sean, uh, I, I, I might assume that Oscar has kind of answered it previously, uh, but I might uh, tell Oscar to, to kind of answer. He says, and I'm assuming that navigate through in this sense is you joining the Andela Talent Network. Uh, and you're trying to understand if you're not a designer of some sort, how do you navigate through? Uh, Oscar, I know you've walked through that previously. Do you just want to talk about the uh, three-step process again?
Hey, well, the strip pro uh, the the three step process is very like very easy. You just have to fill out the form. Like you go to sign up dot uh, .com, right? I will put it in the chat. But uh, you you just have to to go to that website, uh, fill out the form, which is like a uh, eight fields form, right? And then, <clears throat> then, uh, then the next part of the process is uh, to have a, a, an English proficiency test, which is 15 minutes long. Then it's uh, a technical assessment, right? Which is usually between and somewhere around <coughs> there. And at the end, uh, if all looks right, you will have a call with one of our uh, matchers. So that call is more to try to help you set up your profile in a better way, in a more enticing and more even what the market is looking for. So you, you can be presented in the Nella Talent Network in a better way. That's, that's, that's the three-step three process once you join uh, the Talent Network. All right. And, and, and kind uh, of along those lines, one of the things that, uh, that I want to highlight to, uh, uh, to everyone on the, uh, in the, uh, in the audience that uh, something that, uh, you know, Ricardo and I are uh, working on as the, the, the leaders of the, the design practice is we want, uh, we want all our current and future Andellans to, uh, to feel like Andella is a, uh, is their home. Uh, we're, we're working very hard to, uh, to build a, uh, a really innovative design culture here. Um, and, and one of the, I think one of the anchor points uh, of that for all of the uh, the Andellans out there is we want to be with you long term. We want we want to put you on. Well, well, first I would say we want to understand what your goals are. We want to understand where, where you are today, where you want to be in a year, three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, and we want to help build a a path through. Uh, through Andela to, to help you get from point A to point B to, to, to point Z. And uh, we want, uh, you know, one of our goals is to, you know, really, really work on, you know, the, the, the transition from one project to another. So when you finish up uh, one 12, 16, 18 month project, our goal is to, uh, before you even finish, to have your next project set up. So we want, we want everyone to think of uh, Andel as not just a project to project or, you know, a single project uh, uh, opportunity. Um, we want you to think of it as a, as a long-term uh, growth opportunity for, for you as designers, for you as creative professionals. And uh, we really do want to help you get, uh, you know, to pro from, from one project to the, to the next before, you know, have it lined up before you finish uh, your current project. Uh, we want to have the next one lined up and we want to have that project be uh, something that helps get your design career or your creative career to, to the next level. And uh, we, want to be, we want to be a proactive part of, uh, uh, of your uh, journey to, uh, uh, to become better designers in the world. All right. That makes sense. Uh, I just have a question for, I think this time for Ricardo. Uh, this is from, uh, this question is from Awal. Uh, one minute. Let me see if I post it, get a question. Uh, all right, uh, Ricardo, if you're there, it says, uh, do you have a formula uh, to a shorter design process? Uh, and he's trying to talk from a use case where there is a client essentially that just wants the job done like almost right now. And you want to still be able to like have some sort of a properly structured design process. And he's asking that, is there a way you could shorten the design process essentially uh, as against that maybe, I know it's not linear essentially, but he's trying to understand if there is a shorter way to get uh, to the final product uh, without following necessarily all of the processes. So, so. Yeah, it depends a lot in terms of the type of the of the project, you know. But yeah, I think in general you have to to, uh, to understand like the the pain, you know, to understand the pain of the of the of the project and extract. The, all the information as possible of the, because you you won't we won't have time to do research. You won't have time to do any any metrics ex extract any metrics. So you have to understand at least one of the key pains, and with that pain you have to imagine a lot of things. You know, so 
with that, you're going to start with one ideation. And after that, you're going to, to start this process. And, and now you have one, one path, you know. And with that path, you're going to create one, one solution. And that will be like one day, one day process, you know. So you have to identify one, one pain, you know. That's the, that's the main, main solution if you have one day, one day project, you know. It is basically right. understanding, understanding the pain of the client. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, maybe just, just a follow-up question to that will be, uh, Joseph was asking that, uh, how should you go about it uh, when you're presenting a work that is still in development uh, but the design is done and the designer isn't allowed to kind of share until the product is launched. Yeah, I mean, I would, <laughs> I would say, just, you know, if you're not allowed to, if you're not allowed to show it, just don't show it. Uh, don't get yourself into trouble. Would be my, would be my suggestion. Um, you know, uh, you always want to, to, to honor <laughs> honor your NDAs or uh, whatever exactly. agreements that uh, that you have in place, and don't you know. Don't don't put yourself in a position where um, you know where you're breaching confidentiality or or agreements. One thing that you can do, um, you know, some I, I've seen this in the in, in the past with some large enterprise projects where um, I've had some of my previous employees ask, um, you know, can they uh, share designs, uh, you know, one on one with a uh, with a potential client. Uh, instead of putting it in their portfolio. Sometimes you can work out solutions like that where you can, you know, you know, display it in person, but not publicly. Um, so, you know, just be open and honest and, you know, ask, you know, see if, if uh, a potential client would uh, be able to work, uh, uh, you know, work, work something out with you. Can, can, can a potential solution to that be the use case where some of design, some of those designers kind of like have a password on their website? Uh, so to speak, uh, does that look like it's a good solution? I mean, you could you you could do that. Um, you know, if it's if it's a really critical uh, work, something that you're super proud of, you know, it can be a turnoff sometimes to to, to some mm -hmm. clients or some Absolutely. recruiters to to have the password. But you know, if uh, uh, you know if it's really something important, I wouldn't I wouldn't have every. You know, I would make sure not to have every project password pr protected. But if if you have to do one one here and there uh, to you know to get your point across, then then I don't think there's that much of an issue uh, issue there. All right. Um, I think there is a question from Muhammad Abahaji, uh, and he's asking that is it advisable to have multiple professions on the same portfolio, uh, such as maybe web development, data science, uh, on the same portfolio, so to speak. Yeah, I would definitely have um, separate portfolios or separate resumes. I think uh, um, that's one thing I've ran into time and time again over the over the years. Um, is you you want to you want to deliver a very uh, concise and consistent uh, view of, of of what what you do, who you are, and what you do, and uh, when you have two things that are, you know, desperate like that, I Thank think, you. I think you get, you get into the, um, to an area where clients will be, you know, too confused or they won't understand exactly. or they'll, they'll have, you know, uh, certain preconceived thoughts about, uh, what that means. So I would, I would advise against it, against it and to have, you know, separate. Yeah, Mohammed, the guy uh, will the client yeah. will be like, okay, what what this guy wants? You know, he wants to be a, a data scientist. He wants to be a web developer. Or he wants to be a designer. You know, so yeah, we highly advise to be like separated. You know, uh, he wants to, he, the the guy needs to be focused. You know, he wants Maybe. to be just one thing or. And one thing, oh, one uh, one example so. I can give a, about eight years ago, one of one of the most talented uh, UI UX designers that. Uh, that I've ever worked with. He, he was solid A plus UX designer nice. and he was also a motion designer and he was super proud of his motion graphic work. He's not a motion graphic designer. He just likes doing it. And he filled his, you know, just him filling his portfolio with a bunch of motion graphic projects and having it really heavy on motion graphics. 
it was impossible to 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 get him on on projects until he you know really simplified the portfolio and just highlighted his his ux projects and used the motion graphics as support so you know it's it can be it can be a significant uh barrier for some people i mean Fields. As someone kind of asked, I think that's uh, Cibu Ciso. I'm sorry for kind of uh, for pronouncing the name wrong. Is asking what did you use to design your website or to build your website? Uh, I used uh, Webflow. I'm Webflow. a big Webflow okay. fan. Oh, amazing. Um, I think somebody is asking around what should we put in the case study uh, models. Uh, I think maybe you missed out on some of the things that was said by Drew and. Um, uh, some of the things that Ricardo kind of said. Uh, for your case study, essentially, what we want to really understand is your process, uh, maybe more of around how you're able to understand the organizational goal, uh, as well as uh, understanding the user goals and aligning those goals together, and also what of the which of the resources were you able to maximize, and what's the outcome, essentially? How, how was, what was the outcome looking like in terms of the metrics, uh, maybe the, was there like a usability test uh, that was done? What was the outcome of that? Do you have like metrics that you've measured in terms of success rate and the rest? Uh, do you have like post deployment insights essentially into what the users are doing on, on or how they're using the, the platform, so to speak, in terms of what the what the adoption rate and all of those looks like essentially? And if you have that, it's 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 part of what should be in the case study. We just want to know how well of a problem solver you are in terms of identifying the problem, uh, getting workable processes to solve the problem and being able to measure some of those metrics uh, in the pro process, so to speak. Uh, I think, let me see, we, we're, we're kind of rounding up on the questions. Uh, it said, how do you track, Umar Saliu says, how do you track the success metrics of a project? I think we've talked about that, but I, maybe Drew, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a couple of ways. Um... So I think the, the the key to being able to track it is is uh, upfront um, before you begin the uh, you know the uh, the formal design process or when you're transitioning from from research into uh, you know more formalized uh, iterative iterative design process to set the, you know you have to set the measures of evaluation up front um, and those can be uh, like the velocity metrics and cognitive load, like I talked about, it could be, uh, you know, for an e-commerce platform, it could be conversion rates or, you know, monthly recurring revenue for a, uh, for a, uh, service offering. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways to, uh, define, uh, the success, but you got to do it up front and you got to measure it up front. You got to know where you start and then you've got to be able to, uh, to measure it at the end of the project uh, or the product design process. So it might be uh, through usability tests. Um, it might be once a uh, product goes live, what the, you know, what the results are from, from a conversion standpoint, from a you know, average cart value or uh, recurring revenue. Uh, and it might be uh, at the highest level, how much you know, new revenue did this product uh, bring in for the, the organization? But the, uh, yeah, the, the most important thing is you got you got to be able to measure it uh, before and uh, measure it after. Amazing. Uh, maybe this question will be for Ricardo. Uh, somebody is asking: Is IRTA UI design necessary for a UX writing portfolio? Uh, this is from your Fade Fadiola. I think we've answered it before, but uh, maybe you just want to uh, brief. Sorry, through. I was muted. Not necessary. Uh, if you're focusing on UX writing, your you don't need like you user interaction. So, but if you want to to try to focus a bit more on, no, I, I would not say that you you need high tier. No, 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 no need. I think you just want to get to the point where where it's it's uh. Uh, and I'd be curious um, if you're talking about for your, for the the portfolio design itself or the uh, the, the the products or the the. I think um, it's a, it's about the portfolio because uh, she kind of ended it with portfolio, so she's trying to know if uh, 
you really don't i don't think you necessarily need like an high high hand yeah. UI design. you just uh, need to just show your copy what it looks like exactly. before what it looks like now potentially if there are metrics that you might be able to uh kind of see what the eat map looks like now that you kind of change some of those ux copy you, you could just exactly show that. yeah yeah and improvements uh, that's the amazing. important part about user experience yeah. writing uh, I think we've answered Mohamed Tala's question, which is around what should we put in the case study model, uh, which we kind of identified uh, their understanding of the problems and how well they are able to uh, solve the problem. Those are things that we want to see in the case study, essentially. Uh, Emmanuel is asking, I was, oh, sorry, I think that this one, uh, he said, can we organize another one for him? I think this one <laughs> might be handled by Ricardo, uh, sorry, maybe by Oscar, essentially. Uh, uh, there is another question here. He says, which one is more preferable, a portfolio website or sites like Behance? Uh, maybe to answer that from my side will be uh, for you to quickly convert if you're, if you're on a budget. Essentially, you could use Behance, uh, which is like a free tool. Uh, if you need to like build your own portfolio website, that gives you the opportunity and the flexibility to, if you also have um, some strength in interaction design to kind of show uh, some of those things in what you're doing. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I've been showcasing your work on Behance is actually a, a great way because there is a community that kind of backs it up for you. Uh, you could have a portfolio website if, if you're not on a budget as well. Uh, and I'd say the one, one of the, the biggest benefits, I think, to having a, a portfolio website is that uh, uh, you can integrate Google Analytics with it. And yeah. um, depending on what your what your goal is, if your goal is to you know, go out there and um, get some freelance work and build a good freelance uh, client base. I think that would be uh, extremely helpful to know, um, you know, to, to know everything about, about your site, what, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what case studies people are uh, viewing the most, how long they're you know, viewing each case study for. And, and I think those, those are feedback points that uh, can really help uh, you um, progressively iterate on your own portfolio uh, and and consistently make it uh, better and work better for uh, the the purpose that you want it to work for. Exactly. That's why and I would, also, that's why I would do a website. Exactly. Also, with your own platform, you have like freedom to play around with sizes. You know, you don't have like the constraints that Behance has, for example. Mm -hmm. Behance, you have constraints about format. Uh, image sizes, for example, it is something that we are talking about, like resolution. Resolution is key, for example, when you're showing like a, a, a prototype. For example, yeah. sometimes you have to show like a live demo. And with your own platform, you're able to do something like that. You're able to play a video. You're able to do whatever you want. And a code pen, for example, you're able to put something like a code pen live demo. You know, And that's something that with your own website, you're able to do that. All right, uh, that's that, that's amazing. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, somebody's asking uh, around. Uh, John was asking that uh, are these processes always like this in real life? And I think we've kind of addressed that in terms of understanding the the audience and who you're solving for. Uh, depending on on the constraint that you have, if you're like, like a freelancer, for instance, uh, they might just require you to be able to quickly get one or two things done. Uh, you might not. 100% have all of the, the budget thing that is required to like do a proper research. So you might leverage on maybe some bench research in terms of doing competitive analysis, also seeing what's existing out there. Um, but in real life, when you're working with some of the like some of the clients that we have in Andela, uh, if you don't, uh, maybe potentially, you might not be the UX researcher in some of the teams that they already have like a UX researcher, so to speak, uh, but you will be required to be in the ideation session to understand some of those goals, some of the prioritization and be able to work uh, with what is available to you so that you might be able to like uh, come up with experiences that will delight uh, the customers. Uh, I think uh, there's another question around a uh, documentation is asking that how long do you have to keep this documentation? Because uh, he's, he's looking at your project, uh, which is uh, Andrew. I think, I think he's looking at your project and he's saying, how long do you necessarily need to like keep some of this documentation uh, for you to be able to show it without losing some of them? Uh, but I think it's a digital touch point, but you might want to talk about uh, how you kept yours, uh, that you still have it on your website, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, keep it as, as, as long as you feel like you'll need it. I mean, for me, I plan to, you know, I'll probably keep it until I, uh, you know, indefinitely. Um, I think uh, uh, the more you can keep, you know, you never know what uh, 
uh, when you might need some of the documentation uh, in the future. So I would say, you know, keep it for as long as you think it's necessary or, uh, or at least relevant. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think 20, 20 years from now, probably some of it, I won't, <laughs> won't, won't need some of the projects that I did, you know, five or 10 years ago, but um, uh, they probably won't be highly relevant at that point. But uh, I think I would say keep it as long as it's relevant. All right. I, I think somebody was asking that, uh, could you include your salary range in your portfolio? Uh, that's new for me, but I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. No, I, w- I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I think that's... I mean, there are multiple reasons why I why I wouldn't. Uh, the least of which is you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. You never know what your earning potential mm-hmm. uh, is. So, um, you know, if you if your portfolio, if the main purpose of your portfolio is to be client facing as a freelancer, mm-hmm. you might want to put your put your rate if you're you know looking to uh, 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 to to get clients. But if you're if you're you know, going after a uh, a new job or or, or roll through us, uh, you know, definitely not a uh, not advisable. Yeah, uh, this 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 question by Caleb uh, Otieno is, is is a question that kind of comes up a couple of times when we when we're screening designers, uh, and he's asking, is it advisable to include other graphics work? So let's take for instance, I'm a product designer. I've kind of included like two case study, and I just kind of dump. Like I did a dump of all the maybe all the graphics work that I've done in the past while I was a graphic designer before transiting into a product designer. Is it kind of advisable to have all of those in the, in the portfolio? Uh, I wouldn't say I, w- I wouldn't advise. Uh, I wouldn't advise on it. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Um, I, what I think is a good idea, uh, and I've I've done it myself, and I didn't have much success with it. But I've I've been interested in in. Uh, it's drawn my interest as a hiring manager in the past when somebody has like a design playground that has, you know, some of their high fidelity designs, uh, or maybe, um, prototypes, um, things that, uh, uh, things of that nature that are relevant to product design or, or UX that, uh, uh, that, you know, you might not be able to be put in a case study or, you know, if you want to support yourself visually like like that, I think it uh, can be an interesting uh, thing to have like a, a design playground uh, where you go through some of that stuff. But I would uh, I would make sure to that anything that I include on there would be you know highly relevant to what you're looking to do. I tried it out for myself and it didn't. I, it uh, I think maybe one or two people out of like 200 clicked on it. So it wasn't it wasn't valuable for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, Joseph is asking. Um, he's saying that some designers put personal details after each case study, I, and I think you kind of talked about it. That yeah, that is it's a good thing. There there is nothing really wrong with that because you could be going through a case study and you're really interested in just uh, talking with the person almost immediately. So having it there is, is not much of a challenge. I think uh, somebody was asking around design thinking process. That does he apply to front end developers? I, I know, uh, but it's, it's okay if you can take it, uh, Drew. So, what was the, uh, is the Alex? Question? Alex Mayna was asking that does design thinking process apply to front end developers? I mean, it 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 could if you were uh, if you were involved. Some some developers uh, that I've worked with in the past on some projects, um, they're you know they're involved pretty heavily in the. Uh, in the design process. Um, in that case, I think it would be, uh, relevant. So if you, in, if you, as a, uh, front end developer engaged in some or all of the design thinking process with the designers, uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, include it. But, uh, you know, if, um, if that's not something that was part of your, uh, consistent, uh, uh, daily operation, then, then, uh, I wouldn't put, you know, wouldn't put it in your, uh, all right. Uh, I think Sean was asking a question around, it's not like a question, but essentially you were saying that, uh, that it would have been great. or so maybe informative if, uh, you are taking like a deep dive into the portfolio, uh, in terms of the, the processes that kind of happened when you were talking about your project. Uh, I don't know maybe how you want to like ha- handle that question, but I just wanted to, uh, post it out to you. I think uh, say that it's quite informative, 
uh, it will suggest breaking down each process rather than dishing out all case studies at the same time. Yeah, that's good. Good feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me see if we still have any other question here. Uh, I think the question around Google Analytics, we might not be able to answer it because, uh, well, maybe are you using Google Analytics on your website right now, uh, Ricardo or Drew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what kind of metrics are you able to track there? Yeah. So you're. Uh, quite a bit. Um, so I can see, for instance, uh, uh, who's on my website right now. I can, you know, see a historical list of, uh, well, not, not who, but, you know, where the, uh, the, there was a user at the specific time, where their, uh, you know, their geographical location. I can see that down to the, to the city level. Uh, I can see what each, uh, visitor has, um, uh, looked at how, how long their, uh, looking at each uh, piece, uh, so if they, you know, clicked on my AT and T feature store um, case study, I can see how long they looked at it for, uh, what they did next, and uh, uh, you can also set um, uh, kind of metrics that uh, that you know that you would call conversion. So, like, if somebody comes to my website, I can have a metric set up to to track how many people. Uh, land on my website, go to mm -hmm. case studies, and then view a case study. So you can set things like up, uh, things like that up to uh, 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 to track, um, uh, you know, how many people have viewed a certain case study. And I use that data to say, okay, may, may, you know, if people are, you know, not clicking on uh, a particular case study, or they're clicking on it, and and uh, you know, they're only looking at it for twenty seconds. There's probably uh, probably something wrong with the case study that I need to to uh to reassess and and and, and uh possibly rethink it redesign it all right uh thank you so much uh drew for your time i think yeah. we've been able to take a couple of questions and i think we're kind of like uh running out on the clock uh do you have like any last words so to speak for designers uh, that are on this uh, uh webinar so they can um, maybe get some last key points from you maybe just a minute yeah i mean i would i would uh Say we, you know, I'm uh, looking forward, hopefully, to to, to working with uh, with everybody who's uh, in the audience. We have uh, a lot of stuff going on. The design practice is uh, in its beginning uh, stages, but we have a lot of good stuff planned. We believe we can uh, build a really fantastic global design practice and do a lot of great things. And uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, to, to building it with uh, with everybody here's help amazing amazing uh ricardo do you want to like share your last one minute thoughts with us yeah i'm just going to follow drills the comments we are really excited to start the design community here at tendela so yeah reach out to us here at the, the slack channel and let's create a, a really ex exciting design community all right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thanks for joining this uh, session. It's been a wonderful time. Uh, we will be having like similar sessions uh, in terms of uh, covering all the other aspects of design, essentially in terms of uh, some of the processes, information architecture, and all of those rest. Uh, but do enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we hope to see you sometimes again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.